Yeah. The, the first plan is to go through and write down on the title of what you want to use. And then we'll have to announce that order and voices and seeing how we do and all that stuff. Is that how
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us sing glory to God.
chapter 17. Tree imagery is used as a sign of prophecy to tell how the Lord will choose someone from Judah's royal family to reign over all creation. This tree will be planted on Mount Zion, the location of the Holy Temple. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar and will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of his young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain high of Israel, I will plant it, in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of garden will live, and the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees in the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree, I dry up the green tree, and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord.
Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? Hmm. It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Please make yourselves comfortable. So there was a time, not so long ago really, when I had a very different idea of how God's kingdom was supposed to work considering the scripture we just read. I used to think, in my perfect vision of God's kingdom, that if I do A, then God would do B, predictably and always, as in, I would pray for something or someone, say, I would ask for a healing for someone, that's a good thing to ask for, right? And God would do it immediately. Now, honestly, on reflection, I was thinking of God almost like a bending machine. I would offer the right words or prayers or rituals to God, and God would spit out God's answer, moving heaven and earth to give me what I paid for. That's a pretty awful way to treat the creator of all that is, isn't it? I didn't mean it that way. But that's what it boiled down to. It didn't work very well, either. Also, in my perfect vision of God's kingdom, I would always understand, or at least be able to see somewhat clearly what was going on 95% of the time. And when life got hard, God would provide decent answers to my why questions, instead of leaving me to wallow in the unknown. In my perfect vision of God's kingdom, God would make grand gestures and do spectacular things because the kingdom would never be commonplace and ordinary. It would be straightforwardly miraculous. And of course, in my perfect vision of God's kingdom, there would be clear, divine, and sacred boundaries of what is good and what is bad and who is in and who is out. Well, I've learned a lot since I used to think that way. And it's been a bit of a hard lesson to learn. But I've learned that my version of the kingdom is not the same as God's or even anywhere near it. So what does Jesus say about God's kingdom? Well, considering our text today, Jesus must have had an infuriating sense of humor. Because the two parables that make up this week's gospel reading take my old version and ideas about God's kingdom and turn it upside down. In the first parable, Jesus tells us about a gardener who scatters seeds on the ground and then goes off to sleep. The seeds fend for themselves, or as the gospel writer puts it, the earth produces of itself, and when the grain is ripe, the gardener harvests it. 
In the second parable, someone sows a tiny mustard seed in the ground, and it grows into a gigantic bush large enough to offer bird shelter in its branches. Now, both parables, insofar as they are meant to show us what the kingdom of God looks like, are ridiculous. They are big cosmic jokes. As in the case with all of Jesus' parables, these two are intended to stretch our imaginations far beyond any place we take them on our own. Not to keep us comfortable and complacent, but rather to prod and provoke us into wholly different ways of perceiving and relating to what is sacred. So what is the kingdom of God like? Are you sure you want to know? Okay, brace yourself. The kingdom of God is like a sleeping gardener, mysterious soil, an invasive weed, and a nuisance flock of birds. Let's start with the sleeping gardener. If you're any type of perfectionist, workaholic, neat freak, or compulsive worrier, if you insist on being in control, our carrying member and family member of Control Hollis Anonymous here in recovery for the last few decades of my life. If you believe in work before play, if you practice vigilance in all things, then you already know what's wrong with this first parable. Good gardeners don't toss a bunch of seeds into their backyards and then snooze away the growing season. <laughs> No, they plan and plod and hover. They make neat little beds and rows that are well manicured. They keep a wary eye on the weather. They protect their garden from birds and rabbits and deer. And from early spring until harvest, they water, they fertilize, they prune, they weed, and they work. Sometimes a lot. But the gardener in Jesus' parable, he scatters and sleeps. He doesn't slog, he doesn't micromanage, he doesn't second guess. No, like a well-loved infant in his mother's arms, the gardener enjoys the deep rest that comes from trusting in a process much older and larger and more reliable than any he might conjure on his own. In this story of the kingdom, it is not our striving our piety, our doctrinal purity, or our impressive prayers that cause us to grow and thrive in God's garden. It is God's grace alone. Does that sound familiar? Which brings us to the mysterious soil, or as our writer describes it, the automatic earth. According to Jesus' parable, the kingdom of God is both fruitful and fertile, as well as hidden, both generous and mysterious. It works its fertile magic underground, deep beneath the surfaces we see and quantify. Yes, the soil eventually brings forth all kinds of abundance, but the process of that bringing forth, all the nitty-gritty details we long to dissect and master, is hidden from our eyes. If anything, we live in the disconcerting time between the planting and the harvest. We look outside for hope and see only dark soil, only vast expanses of uncertainty and delicate potential. As the American author and poet Annie Dillard puts it so beautifully, our life is a faint tracing on the surface of mystery. In Jesus' second parable, a sower sows a mustard seed in the ground. Now, the joke here is not only that mustard seeds are teeny tiny, but that the people in Jesus' day didn't plant mustard seeds. Mustard was a weed, a noxious, stubborn weed at that. If a first century gardener in Palestine were foolish enough, to plant it, it would quickly take over his land, dropping seeds everywhere and breaking down all barriers of separation between itself and the other plants in the garden. 
Imagine a gardener today planting kudzu, or dandelions, or broomweed. These are commonplace nuisances we try to get rid of, not plants we ever cultivate on purpose. Furthermore, mustard is not a plant that grows with any stateliness or beauty. It's nothing like a cedar tree or a giant sequoia or even a well-tended rose bush. It grows like a weed and it looks like a weed. So what is Jesus saying when he describes the sacred and holy as a tiny insignificant mustard seed? What does it mean to take an invasive spindly weed a plant we'd sooner discard than so, and make it the very heart indeed, the very structural center of God's kingdom. It begs the questions, who and what counts in God's economy? What is beautiful? Who matters? Where do we see the sacred? The last image in this set of parables is that of nesting birds finding shade in the branches of the mustard plant. It's a pretty image on its face, isn't it? But it too, as it turns out, is a joke. Who wants birds taking up residence in their gardens? Birds eat seeds and fruit. They can wreak havoc in a cornfield. That's why birds are why farmers put up scarecrows. But Jesus isn't a scarecrow kind of gardener. Why? Because the kingdom of God is all about welcoming the unwelcome, sheltering the unwanted, practicing radical inclusion. The garden of God doesn't exist for itself. It exists to offer hospitality to everyone the world seems and deems unworthy. It exists to attract and to house the very people we'd so often much rather shun. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. It certainly isn't what I used to think it would be. And it doesn't operate the way I used to think it should. And this is good news, friends. But it may not always be easy news. The truth is, it hurt to surrender my imagination to God's expansive, life-changing care, that the transformation was worth it, and interestingly, amazingly freeing. It can and probably will hurt to learn to trust, to accept mystery, to seek God in a common place, and to embrace the unwanted thing as beloved. It did for me. But that's our challenge, to learn to trust, to grow in relationship with God through Jesus, with the help of the Holy Spirit, and to wait for the abundance that lies in deep darkness to become rooted in us and bloom in all its kingdom glory. For all of us, regardless of our circumstances, the challenge remains to scatter seed and rest in God's grace. To embrace even the weeds and allow them to become havens of rest. I mentioned that I found and continue to find such freedom in this release from my version of things and in embracing God's crazy, wonderful, extravagant version of kingdom life. I don't have to judge anyone or condemn anyone anymore. Instead, I get to live in God's presence and love as God leads. May God help us all to do these hard and beautiful things. May God help us to say and to live the words we pray so often with all sincerity. Thy kingdom come. Amen. Amen.
joining me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we begin our time of prayer, I invite you to assume the posture that is most conducive to your prayer. We come before the triune God to pray for our enemies, ourselves, and our world. Nourish your faithful people through gifts of word and worship. Guide the church in listening to and interpreting your message of grace for this time and place in history. In your wisdom, lead us in expanding the reach of your love. Grant us wisdom as we continue to discern the virtue of you. Lead us to the past you are preparing for us. Bless our call today and guide them in their work. We pray for one another, namely George Mendel, the losers, the Sandy Mesrell, and the Marys and Carol McQuaid. We pray for our sister congregation, namely the Morris, Jane Pratt, the Ruby Schwartz, the Sharons, and Paul Snow. With great joy, we pray for our little man's families, students, and teachers, namely Miss Hope's class, Eloisa, Riley, Kayla, Calvin, Mia, Amara, Evelyn, Julius, and Quentin. Merciful God, nature sings your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Sustain the holy rhythms of creation, days and seasons, hibernation and activity, phases of the moon and tides of the sea. Let these patterns assure us of your constancy and give you thanks for the beauty that surrounds us. Merciful God, we see how you pray. You raise the lowly and humble, those in high regard. Raise up all who are victims of marginalization, discrimination, and hate. As we anticipate Juneteenth, banish white supremacy and front and bigotry from the hearts of your people, and remove the inclination towards anger and violence. We pray for peace for Israel and Gaza. Ukraine, Ukraine, and all places where war and conflict continue to exist. Walk with us in their military service. In the name of Mr. Edwards. Protect their hearts and bring them home safely. Heal their wounds and restore their spirit. Merciful God, attend to all who journey by faith and who have patience for the fulfillment of their healing promises. In the name of Michelle Sutherland, Bobby Parkman, Pamela Hawkman, Hannah Sotek, Judy Flagg, Kennedy Hawkins, Marie Gustafson, George Mungo, Lisa Minnesota Sears, Linda Johnson, Crystal Wheatland, Judy Ritchie, Carol LaRosa, Reverend Marjorie McNeil, Brady Grady, and Linda Beckman. Grant the perseverance to people in physical and occupational therapy. People living with mobility concerns and people facing chronic pain. Be with those in addiction recovery. In healing, keep them safe from temptations to the wilderness. With haste, rescue victims of trafficking, exploitation, and abuse, and bless organizations and individuals who work with great on your behalf. Bless the ministry of companions and homeless and all who gather there. Merciful God, this is my prayer. Here you are invited to offer your own prayers loud or silent. Dear Lord, please hear us in our prayer for Lynn and her family. Wrap your arms around her and continue to give her strength and her struggles. 
merciful God, as you have loved us, so let us love one another. And how our fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, adopted fathers, and chosen fathers convey and grace this gift of love to your children. That these relationships are strength and welcome for their comfort and peace. Merciful God, with gratitude, we remember the Emmanuel and Nine Marys, our beloved Teddy Moore, and all the saints who now are at home with you. Plant seeds of your wisdom and witness in our hearts that we may grow in faith until we join in your heavenly love. Merciful God, our Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Let us offer one another a sign of peace and of love, and let us prepare for this morning's offering.
is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and light. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise of Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will even in giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his friends. And he said to them, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them to drink as well, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and to all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ is God, Christ is risen, Christ is on my hand. Therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. 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 Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may receive, may live to the praise of your glory, and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. 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 Join our prayers with those of your servants in every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer of Jesus on us. Our Father, who art in heaven, our Lord, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, the Lord be your name, our Lord, 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 Friends, the table is set, it is open to all. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. <coughs>
of the player. And the world is really great. Thank you for adding so much to our worship this, uh, this past season. Are there other comments? Yes, um, on that note, Go in peace. Christ is with you. Christ is with you.